Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta with another Great Players of the Past lecture. We actually had a virtual class like usual on Tuesday, but the FBR got, uh, well, the, the screen capture, I mean, got uh, corrupted. So um, it's actually a redo. Uh, but anybody who is like a YouTube content creator knows about redoing uh, content, you know, a second or even third time. So. You know, it happens, but uh, hopefully this, this recording will be even better because uh, I'll already have gone through the material, so I know it even more than I usually do, which usually I know pretty well. <laughs> but that's why I don't have, like, the, uh, you know, the old, what, what are they called, the cans, you know? <laughs> I don't have the cans. Just, just one microphone this time. But um, I wanted to talk today about Sultan Khan, who was uh, an Indian chess player, although... His uh, nationality is, is a little bit in question because it was, uh, you know, he was born in, I think, 1903. In fact, let me get the, uh, the Wikipedia up here for you. It, it's present-day Pakistan, but um, at the time it was British-controlled India where he, where he was born and, and lived. So most places that I find call him an Indian chess, chess player. And there's even a book that came out recently published by New in Chess, uh, written by Daniel King, I believe it was Daniel King, that did call him an Indian chess master. So I think I'd, I'd refer to him as, as Indian. Although, you know, for me, I'm not really a, a, an historian or don't, I don't know much about geography, like the song goes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess that's fair enough. Uh, as we can see by his, his pretty lengthy Wikipedia article, uh, it says that he was, you know, one of the best players of his time, and he won the British Championship, what was it, three times? Yeah, right here. Three times out of four. He only played four times and won three of them, so that's pretty impressive. He played, uh, he played board one for, for uh, England three times. Thrice played first board for England. And uh, yeah, he definitely had an unusual life. You know, he was a servant, um, and so he wasn't really like... Uh, Chess wasn't his number one priority, of course, and yet he was still able to be, I would say, in the top ten. You know, he beat players such as uh, Capablanca and, and Tartakower and guys like that, Floor. Um, so he's definitely no joke. Let's see, what else does it say? Anything cool? He won a match against somebody I never heard of. Uh, let's see. Uh, something about Miss Fatima. It says uh, his peak was equivalent to 2530 FIDE. So that's pretty good, obviously. Yeah, and he has notable games like where he beat Capablanca, which is what we're going to look at first of all. And uh, yeah, other games here. So definitely an unusual story. Um, it's pretty rare that somebody who isn't you know, doesn't have a lot of opportunities, they come up and become one of the strongest players in the world. So definitely inspiring for anybody who uh, wants to be a strong chess player. But all right, let's look at the, the games already, huh? Yeah, the first game we're going to look at, like I had already mentioned, is his win against Capablanca, the, uh, the world champion. Although this was in 1930, and I forgot to make sure if he was world champion then. I think he wasn't, actually. Um, I, I kind of forgot when he lost Eliakin, but anyways, he, Capablanca was not very weak in 1930, that's for sure. So let's take a look at this game. Khan outplays him pretty nicely early on. They go for a sort of a Queen's Indian, and Sultan Khan plays a3, which is a move usually attributed to Kasparov or Petrosian, or both. A lot of times it's called the Kasparov-Petrosian Queen's Indian. And it's a little bit slow of a move, obviously, playing a3 doesn't get developed, it doesn't attack the center. However, it does prevent bishop b4, which stops black from attacking the center. So in a vicarious sort of way, it does control the center. And uh, like I said, 50 years later or so, um, Kasparov would be playing this at a high level. And Capablanca plays the correct reaction here. He goes for d5. This is absolutely the right move, and playing d5 in a Queen's Indian is uh, sometimes bad, sometimes just wrong to do that, but 
against a3, it makes the most sense to attack the center immediately and aggressively because a3 doesn't really do that. C takes D. And now Capablanca plays to his style. He takes with the E pawn, which I would say is, is probably a little bit worse than knight takes. Uh, knight takes is better because it keeps the diagonal open for the bishop. And it's not as classical of a way to go. You know, taking with the pawn is, isn't a classical style, keeping the pawn in the center. That's what, uh, that's what you know, you're taught as a classical player. You want to occupy the center with pawns. Whereas knight takes is a more hyper-modern style. But it makes sense to play in a hyper-modern style when, uh, well, first of all, you're playing the Queen's Indian, right? <laughs> so that, that's a hyper-modern opening. You might have to play it in a hyper-modern style. But in this case, you might not want the pawn on d5 because when we, well, for two reasons. One is kind of obvious. It's the bishop on b7 is blocked by the pawn. That's all there is to it. And uh, like, for example, if you play a Tartakow or Queen's Gambit declined, then typically when white plays an early c takes d, if the bishop's still here, black will play bishop e6 typically in that case. And very often in a Tartakow, if you play bishop b7 and they take later, you might play knight takes. Usually you do. So that's all in keeping with, uh, with what I'm saying here and, and the opposite of what Capablanca did. Um, for one reason, like I said, it blocks the bishop. Another is that when you play c5, you will probably have a weak d-pawn because black does not have an e6 pawn and won't be able to play the move c6. And you'll probably end up with, uh, after takes takes, what's known as hanging pawns, the hanging pawns formation, which uh, that, that isn't necessarily very bad for black, um, especially because he has more space, but the d-pawn is weak in that case. And if you play knight takes and then later play c5, you won't have that situation if the pawns get traded, which they probably will. We'll just take back with the bishop. And the structure will remain symmetrical. So it makes a lot of sense to play knight takes. And if you look at modern GM games, it's almost always going to be knight takes at this moment. But like I said, Capablanca played uh, E takes, Khan just played it sort of like a Tartakow or Queen's Gambit decline. Bishop g5, e3, and bishop d3. And here Capablanca plays, I think, the correct idea, but maybe he, it was a little bit early. It was not even enough to call it a mistake, really, in my opinion, because he could have been okay later. But he plays knight e4. That's the logical way to go when you have this setup with black because he's already got his bishop here. He's just establishing control on the white squares. Um, and that's a great idea, but we'll see in the game that he doesn't get to play the move c5 later, and it's sort of because of this move order. Uh, um, an improvement might be to play knight bd7 here, and then c5 first, and then knight e4, right? And then knight e4 at this point after we got in the move c5, where Khan would probably, in this case, have played bishop f4, since that's sort of what he did in the game. And I like white a little bit. White's going to have a better pawn structure because this pawn is going to be weak. Black's going to have more space, so it's not that bad. But it's one thing to have more space, but if the opponent, in this case white, has all the pieces on active squares, your space advantage is a little bit less meaningful. You know, the reason that you want to have more space is that your opponent can't develop their pieces very efficiently um, or actively. So the fact that white does get that is making black space advantage a little bit less meaningful and probably white should be a little bit better. But definitely something that Capablanca shouldn't be too afraid of. Um, I'm sure he would like a position like this where he could still try to win against a presumably weaker player. But he plays knight e4 first, attacking the bishop, knight d7, and queen c2. And now he doesn't have time for c5 because his knight is hanging, or it would be a pawn hanging. But either way, there's three attacking on e4, and black only has two defending. So he has to play a move to deal with that threat. He can't play c5, so he goes actually for f5, which is not a bad move. but 
after f5, it was a pretty weakening move. It's um, Khan that has a nice forcing move here to try to get some advantage. Um, this might be a good moment for you at home to pause and try to find the most aggressive, threatening move for, for white to play. Also, by the way, um, it, it prevents black from playing c5. That's a key point. All right, so hopefully that was enough time for you to pause. He went for knight b5. Great move. Best move. Aggressive move. And it's obviously targeting c7. That goes without saying. But uh, the real question is, how does this prevent black from playing c5, right? Well, it's actually taking advantage of the f5 pawn move, which weakened e6. So if you play c5 or c6, either way, we'll play knight c7, hop in there. You're going to have to move your rook unless you want to lose the exchange, but then it's fork town, knight e6, attacking the queen and the rook, and therefore winning the exchange. And uh, definitely, Khan would win that. So you can't play c5 after knight b5. That's one of the benefits of that move. So instead, Capablanca sort of bites the bullet here. There's not a convenient way to defend that square on, uh, on c7 at all. He could, if he plays something like rook c8, then uh, a7's hanging. So that's not going to be correct. And, well, the computer actually recommends him to play sort of a counterattacking move, a very aggressive counterattacking move, which he probably didn't... I mean, it's not that he didn't see it, but he just probably didn't take it seriously. G5. Again, he didn't play this move, <laughs> just for sort of forcing White to take it. But there are a lot of forcing moves here that um, sort of justify this. So first he'll trade queens in this variation, attack the bishop. F4 attacking this bishop. Yeah, you got to play all these forcing moves as black. Rook e8. This is also a forcing move, by the way, protecting the bishop, but lining up against the king. So he could play bishop takes bishop, followed by knight g3 check, and winning the exchange, or a rook maybe. Probably just the exchange. So you castle out of that. But now after a6, you'll notice that the knight has no safe square to go. You could play knight c3, but then we'll win back our pawn after we trade this and trade that free pawn. Bishop f5. So black would actually win back the pawn that he lost on c7 with all of these forcing moves. Uh, but even still, white would be a little bit better here. Black's bishop is bad on b7. Black is a worse pawn structure. But black does have active rooks, so... It's not dead lost. Um, it's far from it, in fact. I think that with perfect play, it should definitely be a draw here. I guess I'd rather have white, but it's not that big of a deal. There are some interesting uh, alternatives here that don't quite work. For example, uh, let's say instead of playing uh, knight takes h4, in this position, white wants to avoid losing the c3 pawn, and instead intermezzos with bishop takes e4. And in this way, if black recaptures on e4, then white will take back, and white won't lose the pawn on c3. Uh, the problem is, of course, that black gets to intermezzo as well with bishop f2 and will remain equal material. In fact, this is just good for black after you take here and I take here. I've got a really nice e-pawn and f-pawn situation going on. Or also, for example, if white wants to take the knight here first, then knight c3 will be safe for the white knight, but not really because now after pawn takes, we got two knights hanging. That's actually going to be losing material for, for white. But also, black has to play a correct move order in this variation, too. If you take, we were playing a6 here, remember, but if you take on h4 first, then after knight takes, the knight won't be attacked in this variation we just looked at. So after a6, white could intermezzo, bishop takes e4, and remain a pawn up. You know, if you take the bishop, I'll move my knight, and you can't take on c3 anymore. Or if you take the knight, I'll move my bishop, but either way, I'm going to be a pawn up with white. So this is an interesting tactical variation. 
which is not at all forced, although there are a lot of forcing moves, but could go slightly differently. But either way, um, that was probably the best that both sides could do, and it would still be a little bit better for white. Um, definitely better than how the game went as far as from Capablanca's perspective, because what he did was he played bishop d6, which is uh, definitely a concession. After takes, takes, he loses the bishop pair and gets a worse pawn structure. So this is already basically positionally lost for black, and Khan's going to have to show some good technique to win, um, especially because this knight on e4 is pretty good. It's one thing that's keeping, uh, keeping Capablanca sort of in the game, but not really, <laughs> not really. H4, great move here, by the way, stopping g5, which is a good idea. It, it's kind of amazing to me how well Khan understood uh, how to play in a closed position, considering, you know, like I was saying earlier when we were looking at his Wikipedia, that he's not exactly a like, professional player in, in, in the, the traditional sense, at least. You know, his career was only about five years long, but he still absorbed a lot of knowledge and understood the game pretty deeply. And especially in the 1920s, 1930s, when he was playing, uh, you don't see a lot of closed positions, uh, or even before that, like games from 1910 or you know late 1800s, there weren't a lot of closed positions. It was a lot of uh, King's Gambits and, and Evans' Gambits, and, and you'd learn very well how to play tactically from learning about those games and, and observing those games. But there weren't a lot of great examples of closed positions, you know, because Petrosian didn't exist yet, or, or Karpov didn't have these nice grinding wins. So he couldn't study those games, but he still understood how to play in a closed position, which is pretty impressive to me. Hits the queen. Like, look, for example, he knows to move his queen when it's attacked. <laughs> Come on, how, how do you learn that? And he goes for knight d2. Yeah, computer is actually recommending knight g1, which is pretty funny. Um, wants to play knight e2, followed by f3. And the knight on e2 guards the dark squares pretty nicely, and then he could just kick the knight away <clears throat> and get rid of black's main main compensation for his bad structure and bad, uh, bad you know, two bishops for white, which is bad for black, obviously. So, <clears throat> knight d2. And Khan's idea is he's just going to take the knight. That's all. Which he does. Good idea. F takes. I was looking at this variation. If knight takes, um, we might be able to play f3. Even though never play f3. <laughs> but it might win material. So always win material. You know, you got to balance. F3. The only square for the knight that doesn't lose a knight is going to be f6, right? But then we block the rook. So give me that pawn. What's convenient about this from white's perspective is that it attacks the rook. So if they play a move like knight h5, trying to target all these bishops and take advantage of the uncastled king, we could just take everything. Take that. Even if they take that, give me that. You can uh, get your little check going. Even take here. It's threatening this, but bishop takes d5, check. Protects the f-pawn. White remains a rook up, so this will definitely be winning. Um, even the king is not even really in danger here unless you're uh, pretty careless. The bishop on d5 makes a good impression. So Capablanca couldn't really take with the knight, so he takes with the pawn, which does, it fixes his structure a little bit in a technical sense because they're not double isolated pawns on the d file anymore. But it's, that's still terrible. I mean, both these pawns are very weak, so it's not like that really helped him in a practical sense. Bishop e2. Rook c6. And yes, like I was saying, Khan really understands how to play in a closed position, and that's obvious from his next move, g4. Really nice stuff. Attacking on the wing is a lot safer when the center is closed. If those four pawns were gone, then g4 would really weaken this diagonal. But when the center is closed, you're a little bit, it's a little bit easier for you to attack on one side of the board, like with h4, g4. That's definitely a, uh, a common way to play in a closed position. Like I said, uh, you know, Petrosian would do that all the time. Yeah, rook fc8 kicks the knight. And then he could just take this pawn with check, by the way. That's not bad. 
But Cotton's a very cautious player. You know, that's what his technique is like. He doesn't want to, uh, he, he doesn't want to give his opponent any counterplay, especially when he's positionally winning. If he's positionally winning, he won't take a pawn and give his opponent any semblance of counterplay. That's not his style. So he goes for bishop g4, which uh, threatens the rook. And here Capablanca makes a good practical decision. He gives up two rooks for a queen. Check. And this would be mate. <laughs> really, it would. But um, gets to take it. And the reason he did this, did Capablanca, is because it, it makes it a little bit difficult for, um, for Khan, his king, right? He can start to harass the king, and Khan's going to have to figure out the best way to organize his position. Um, so this might actually might be another good moment to pause. Your king's in check. You only have four legal moves, I believe. So which one would you play to try to have the best technique, organize your position, and eventually win by... Uh, by having the bishop pair and the two rooks against the queen. All right, hopefully that was enough time for you to pause the, the video here, if you wanted to. And white's got, yeah, like I said, four legal moves. Um, king b3, if you said that one, well, <laughs> sorry to say, queen c4 is mate. So that's the worst legal move on the board, or in most positions, <laughs> that would be the worst legal move. So don't go for king b3. The other three moves are all logical. Um, the best one's going to be king b1, which will always play king b1. Anybody knows that from watching my dad's stream, for example. And uh, the, the idea is that all white needs to do is get the rooks in on the c-file, like how I outlined with these arrows. And once you do that, your rooks are active. Still, like I said, you have the bishop pair. Black has a terrible pawn structure. It's going to be a technical win. Two rooks are better than a queen as well. And as long as you get your pieces active and your king safe, black won't have counterplay. And uh, that's sort of how the game goes, actually, even though Khan made a mistake here. And actually, he wanted to keep the rooks connected, so he played king d2, which does keep the rooks connected. There's no doubt about that. But unfortunately, queen c4 is really strong in this position. Whereas, imagine the king was on b1, and he played queen c4, just kick it away, no problem. <laughs> sure, give me the check, I'll just go to a2, start to double it up. Easy. But here, if you play rook c1, then queen d3 check is kind of annoying. You could even follow up with bishop a6, try to go to f1 check after that, you know, because you'll play king e1. And, yeah, that'll be kind of a big problem. So, Khan has to avoid that with bishop e2 x-clamp. That's the right move. And he goes for uh, queen b3, hitting on b2. Rook a b1. Yeah, you could play king c1, although this is sort of an admission that you should have played king b1 earlier, because now you want to go king b1 and rook c1 and rook c3, um, which this is actually maybe the best way to play, but <clears throat> Khan's not going to do that when he, when he, just, played, uh, he just played king d2, right? So he plays rook a, b1, and his idea is, I'll go here to c1, I'll kick you away, and then I'll double it up, etc. Um, the problem is that Capablanca could throw a wrench in the works here, which uh, he ends up actually making a mistake here, and, and not exactly testing Khan. He plays <clears throat> king f7, which that's a fine improving move. He just wants to move his king to protect the pawn. Maybe he can move his knight later, and his king will be better sort of in the center uh, because this is getting pretty close to an endgame, and, and it's not like his king's going to be under attack on e7 or anything. So that's a good idea, but he needs to play more against the king's position. He goes for bishops. He should go for bishop c6. Bishop c6 to b5 is the idea. If at least he could trade white square bishops, then he could have access to these white squares, and that would help him harass the king, and in fact, maybe prevent him from losing. For example, rook c3, this would be the idea for white. Rook c3, and then maybe we could move our bishop away, and then we could get back to doubling rooks, 
and winning the game with the two rooks against queen and, and the bishop pair advantage and the better structure. But queen a2 is a fine tactical resource in this exact position because, well, it attacks the rook. <clears throat> you can't really play rook c1 because then your pawn would be hanging with check. So you could get two pieces for a rook, but you'd have to give up two pawns here on the queen side. Only move his rook c2 to not lose the rook, and then we'll take that. And he's got two connected pass pawns to compensate for the fact that it's rook and two bishops for a queen. Obviously, rook and two bishops are way better than a queen, but having two connected pass pawns is pretty good. And also, the computer just says this is equal. I'm pretty sure because the white king won't be able to be sheltered, um, at least not in a <clears throat> productive way. You could definitely see a lot of checks happening here. For example, if we get queen d3 check, you can't just run your king away to the, to the king side because your rook would be hanging, so you'd actually have to stay on the queen side. We could go back to a3 check, and the king being weak, coupled with the two connected pass pawns, is going to give black sufficient counterplay to, uh, to equalize in this exact position. So <clears throat> both sides uh, flubbed it a little bit there. Uh, kind of tough for, for Khan to envision exactly how, how to organize and overwhelm black. And also maybe Capablanca thought about that idea but thought that it would lose two pieces for a rook and didn't really uh, evaluate correctly the final position there. So hard to say because this is obviously very difficult. A lot of calculation and a lot of understanding come in, comes into play here. So he instead goes for king f7, but now this allows Khan to, yeah, organize his position and, and win. b4 is a good move, by the way. It's The idea is it's against bishop a6. You don't want to trade the bishop pairs uh, as white here. The white square bishop would be trading away the bishop pair for white, and then we could play b5 as, as a response. So he can't uh, he can't try bishop a6 here. So that was a good move. And yeah, now he's fully organized his position, and it should be a win. <clears throat> there are many ways to try to win this position. We'll see that Khan combines the idea of bishop g4 with uh, playing on the queen side. Always repeat. Okay, he's taking his sweet time here. I mean, it takes like 50 moves from here <laughs> for him to win the game. Yeah, moving around, <laughs> moving around and around. So he got he gets his rooks here. Not that it matters too much, but his rook here stops the queen from infiltrating on the first rank, and this rook protects this pawn tactically because if you take it, we'll take on a6, or even bishop g4 might be good there. So queen h3, a4. Yeah, they move around a bit. <clears throat> Khan is just trying to make sure everything is hunky-dory. And yeah, this is kind of nice for Khan because if he ever wins these pawns, like by getting his white square bishop in, oh, pretty bad with the arrows today, that he can uh, he could take those pawns and then it's queen town. Queen ten, I should say. So yeah, it goes like this. He doesn't mind <clears throat> that he doesn't have any pawn breaks here. That's okay. He could still win by trying to play bishop g4. Yeah, he's taking a sweet time. <laughs> I love it. Triangulation there. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about. He's threatening bishop g4, which doesn't win the queen, <clears throat> but he'll go in here, pick up the pawns, and uh, that'll be it. That'll be all she wrote. So in order to prevent that, Capablanca plays bishop c8. But this gives up the c6 square, rook c6. And now b6 is falling, and, and with it, the whole, the whole game. Still, takes his sweet time here. Doesn't want to give up the bishop pair. Doesn't mind to lose the f-pawn. <clears throat> he actually doesn't mind to lose kingside pawns here at this point. Yeah, see, he gives up, <clears throat> gives up the g-pawn, even potentially the h-pawn. But finally, takes b6 after all that. And, uh, yeah, here comes the b-pawn. This is a nice technique. He's going to go for <clears throat> bishop, I mean, knight d7. 
So bishop b5 cuts that off. Really nice. And after rook b8, Capablanca already called it quits. There's no way that you can get into this king. Can't go queen f1. Can't uh, even sneak the queen in this way because e2 is covered. Can't go on the first rank. Can't take that. But you can't do anything. He's totally locked out of the king side, and, and white's king is completely safe. The, the only plan that black would have is to try to take this pawn, move his queen away, and then push the h pawn for like you know, a total of six moves or something. But obviously that's not going to be fast enough when the B pawn is already already just two steps away. So really nice technique, gradual, cautious technique by Khan. But that's what you have to do to beat a guy like Capablanca. He's not going to let you, uh, he's not going to let you win. And if you, if you give him any counterplay, he'll, uh, he'll punish you. So uh, Khan did a good job preventing all counterplay and uh, outplaying Capablanca early on. You know, from with that knight b5 move, that put enough pressure on Capablanca that you know his c pawn's hanging, and he he had to, or at least he felt like he had to give up the bishop pair in order to, um, in order to, you know, keep the position alive. Well, giving up the bishop pair is better than losing a pawn, even though he did have kind of a, a crazy uh, variation that we looked at with g5. But you're not really always going to count on that, and Capablanca could have played a little bit more accurately earlier to make it so he didn't have to find such a complicated variation. But um, yeah, Capablanca sort of made a couple of very small errors early on, and it was impressive that Khan put so much pressure punishing those small errors that, uh, that it ended up giving him a technically winning position, basically. So all right, that was Khan's most famous win, and uh, I think, yeah, definitely a great game. And you're gonna have to play a great game to beat a great player like JRC. So let's move on to the next one, which has a lot of similarities in my opinion. We won't save. And he's playing Osip Bernstein, who is well known also for playing a game against Capablanca, where Capablanca beat him with that famous Queen B2 tactic. Although I kind of spoiled it for you, sorry if you haven't seen that one before. But uh, Capablanca plays a nice tactic at the end of his game against Bernstein. Definitely, that's a super famous game. You've probably seen it. Um, or you can you could definitely look it up uh, after of course after the video right <laughs> so yeah Khan's playing Bernstein here Bernstein's a pretty strong player from the 30s um, and maybe even earlier than that maybe even later than that <laughs> not entirely sure so they go for yeah sort of a G3 like King's Indian attack but he's played D4 already. And Bernstein plays a very strange move here. If you have black in this position, I would highly recommend you to develop your white square bishop to one of these two squares, f5 or g4. Definitely logical. You can follow up with e6 and bishop e7, castle, etc., etc. Playing like a London, sort of. But instead, Bernstein plays the move c5. And I think that people definitely underestimated Khan a bit. You know, they knew he was a pretty strong player, obviously. And... <clears throat> They knew that his style was that he's very solid, right? A very solid positional player. So with black to beat a, a solid positional player, you're going to have to do something a little bit unusual. And that's exactly what Bernstein goes for here. I think that it, it's definitely not called for in a positional sense because, you know, he opened up the bishop and he wasted a tempo, basically, by playing c6, c5. So it's not very logical to do that, in my opinion. And Khan takes, and, you know, in my opinion, a C4 would definitely be the way to go here. Why not open up the position when your opponent's wasted a tempo like that? I would definitely be preferring to do that with black, I mean with white, obviously. But Khan has a different opinion. He takes, and he's just going to try to keep the pawn with bishop e3, or at least make black jump through some hoops to, to recapture it. If you play a move like C4 here, that's not going to really make it as far as an advantage is concerned. Bishop takes c5. You're actually transposing back into theory here, believe it or not. Uh, even though black wasted a tempo playing c6 and then c5, generally this position is reached by black playing bishop e7 and then after takes bishop takes c5, which black didn't do that in this variation. Black actually got to play bishop from f8, takes c5 in one turn, thereby saving the tempo that he previously lost by moving a c pawn twice. 
And that's how you would transpose back into theory. It doesn't really make sense for white to do that since obviously black kind of made a mistake by playing c5 earlier there, you know, playing c6 then c5. So Khan is trying to punish that with bishop e3. A very logical and correct way to go at this point. This makes Bernstein play knight a6 to win back his pawn, or he could have moved his queen, I guess. But either way, he'll have to jump through some hoops a little bit like this in order to uh, in order to recapture the pawn. And after c takes, he plays e takes, which is probably the, we the best way to go. Um, it, it gives him an isolated pawn, which obviously you don't want, but it allows him to develop his bishop, which obviously you do want. And the problem with taking with a piece here, like the knight or even the queen, is that it'll be a very symmetrical structure, but Bernstein will have the worst white square bishop. You know, that, that's the problem, is that, that you don't want to have a totally symmetrical position, but your bishop's bad uh, compared to white, so white's bishops would be amazing in that, in that structure. So that's exactly what Bernstein would, would want to avoid if he's trying to win. Again, presumably, Bernstein thought, I'm better than this guy. Right? <laughs> Presumably he thought that. So, you know, he probably wanted a position that was a little bit asymmetrical so he could try to outplay a little bit. So he plays E takes. Now the pawn structure is not symmetrical. Um, the benefit from White's point of view here, though, in this isolated queen pawn as compared to some others, is that the, white, uh, the dark square bishops were traded. So that's actually generally Black's best attacking piece in this structure. And the fact that those bishops got traded is definitely boding well for white. The fact that any pieces get traded is usually good when you're fighting against the isolated queen pawn, which white's doing here, of course. And uh, also, white just has a perfect setup. The bishop here is great. The king is going to be safe. A lot of times in an isolated queen pawn, the side fighting against the isolated queen pawn gets uh, attacked on the king side. That's not likely to happen in this pawn structure and with considering he fiend his king's bishop. So yeah, white's definitely a little bit better here. Uh, black goes for a bad way to develop here. Uh, Bernstein definitely should not have played b6. This is kind of a rookie mistake, although it, this game t took place in 1932, so uh, a rookie mistake now is different than it was back then. You know, even a strong player like Bernstein or other top players in the 30s, you could see them making a mistake like this. This is definitely, it's basically the same mistake that Capablanca played, but in reverse. All right, you don't want your bishop here blocked behind your d-pawn. In the first game we looked at, Capablanca already had the bishop there, and he took back with the e-pawn, which blocked his bishop. And here Bernstein's doing it in reverse. Bernstein already had the pawn on d5, so he shouldn't be putting his bishop there. I would prefer to put my bishop even on e6, which I think that, you know, generally that gets kind of a bad rap. Um, it, for people who've played isolated queen pawn, they don't want their bishop there a lot of the time because it looks passive. It's, it is a little bit passive. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but it does defend the weakest pawn that you've got. And this diagonal <clears throat> on c8 to h3 is actually a pretty good diagonal. Um, much better, for example, than <clears throat> this diagonal turns out to be from b7 to h1 or a8 to, to h1. So... Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's spending time, too, to put the bishop on a worse diagonal. b6 spends a tempo to move that pawn, as opposed to bishop e6. Um, so it's slower and it's a worse diagonal. That definitely isn't correct for him to do. Queen d4. He just wants to put both his rooks in the center, as he does. Yeah, here we go. Really nice, really nice solid positional play. Gotta love it. Queen e7. I looked at this variation, I just thought it was pretty interesting. Rook c8, going on the open file, which I'll say that when I have an isolated queen pawn, I generally don't really love to put my rook on the open c file, because usually that implies that they'll trade rooks at some point. But it might be a move to consider. I thought that an interesting move for white here would be bishop h3. This seems pretty logical to me, because black is spending a lot of resources on this diagonal. And he just totally vacated this one. So why not get our bishop on this active diagonal? Rook c4. But we could actually win a pawn here with white by taking and 
taking advantage of the pin, and then picking up the pawn at the end. Check. Yeah, I have to play bishop f1, because king g2, g5 is kind of annoying. So we'll play bishop f1. But um, even here, black does have some compensation for a pawn. Uh, it, like I said, it's a pawn up, four against three on the kings. It's a clean pawn. Um, but the rook on d1 is pinning the bishop on f1. And that situation is pretty annoying. The rook is very active on d1, and black's king is better too. So black does have some activity to compensate for the isolated pawn that he lost. Um, even still, white doesn't have to go into this variation with bishop h3. Doesn't even have to take the rook on c4 with the queen and, and win the pawn like this, but it was just a variation I was looking at, and I think it's a logical way to play. Um, I don't really know if, if white has very serious winning chances here, though, so you might want to avoid it. But it just goes to show that rook c8 is, is a playable move because these forcing variations aren't, aren't losing. And if you're not losing by force, probably playable variation. So queen e7 was played instead. And Cap, uh, Khan, rather, gets pretty aggressive here. Knight e5? Okay. Yeah, I think that his point was that he actually wants to play, believe it or not, the move knight d7. Yeah, I'll show you what I mean. Because Bernstein plays rook fd8, which prevents that, actually. The computer recommendation is knight, uh, rook fe8, uh, which is a fine move. I mean, white could just defend that if he wanted, right? f4 is not a terrible move. White's probably a little bit better there. But like I was saying, I think that both players, Khan and Bernstein, were considering the move knight d7 for white here, which does give black some problems. Let's say you take it with the knight. We'll take here, and then we'll infiltrate on the seventh rank with rook c7 following up. This is probably something that black wants to avoid. Computer doesn't care. You know, computer's like, I can defend this. But most people would be a little bit concerned with black here, with rook c1 to c7 coming up, and uh, potentially the two pigs on the seventh, right? We all know about that, and, and we, we try to avoid it if possible. Like, for example, trading queens here would be ill-advised, I think, for, for black. Which is why, by the way, you should probably play knight takes d7 in this position if you had black instead of queen takes, because that would transpose basically to the same variation where you, you did play queen takes. So, yeah, I mean, either way, that is pretty annoying, and I think that Bernstein was avoiding the losing the seventh rank in that way, and so he played rook fd8. But Khan actually gets some initiative going with his favorite move. This would be another great moment to pause and try to figure out how Khan played to keep up the initiative. So, all right, hopefully that was enough time for you to pause. And uh, knight b5, yes, just like he played against Capablanca, right? The exact same move. Knight b5, trying to get in rook c7, winning a piece. And, yeah, was, Khan was playing like so solidly. And now all of a sudden, he plays knight e5 and knight b5, and real threats are happening against the position um, that black has to be concerned about. So he goes for knight c5. There was an interesting variation here uh, with, actually it was probably last move, yes. Sort of forgot to mention this. Knight takes f2 is, a, is an interesting idea here for black. The point is that Obviously, if you play queen takes, your knight's hanging, right? So maybe king takes, but then your knight is still hanging because we've got a fork on g4. You might call it a g fork. You might. King g1, and then we'll pick this up. So black won the pawn, sort of temporary because we can win this pawn, and it'll be equal pawns. Now, black should generally pre be pretty happy if he gets to trade his d5 pawn for any pawn, right? Like f2 in this case and white actually has a worse structure. But clearly, white is much more active than black here. I mean, this knight is loose, and this bishop's loose, which is kind of important right now even, because knight f6 check would pick up the bishop and uh, leave you with a bad structure, and I have a bishop against knight, where in this position, I think it's pretty obvious that the white square bishop would be better than the knight on e5. Also, white's rooks are really active as well. So everything looks really nice for white here. I'm pretty certain both sides considered this variation 
and thought it to be good for white. And so Bernstein avoided it and Kahn allowed it, but it didn't, obviously didn't happen. Yeah. So he played rook fd8, knight b5. Good on you if you found that. Knight c5 to block it, but he just kicks it away. Get out of here. Knight e6. And one nice thing about b4 is that it allows queen b2, which is a great square for the queen, right? It protects the b pawn. It covers d4, which is strategically speaking an important square. Even protects the knight. Even protects e2 for what that's worth, because that could be weak. So great square for the queen. And Bernstein misses a chance here to get some counterplay. So again, this would be another good moment to pause and try to figure out if you had black, how would you get some activity and some counterplay so you can play the position actively? Yeah, so hopefully you found the move, or at least thought of the move, a5. Not what Bernstein played. a5 just activates the rook from a8. And uh, it's kind of tough to get that rook in in other ways because the a pawn would be hanging like if you play, for example, rook c8. And you'll just lose your a pawn potentially. Which is not going to be great. But it, even the knight will go to c6. I don't think it's going to get trapped there or anything. So yeah, a5 is the way to go. a3, for example, not the only move, but I think this is what Khan would play because after takes takes, he gets to keep the knight out of c5. But at least here, uh, Bernstein would get some counterplay, some activity for his rook. He'd have to attack the pawn, and uh, Khan would play a move to defend that pawn, but it would be kind of a passive move. I mean, obviously rook b1 would be very passive, or even knight d3. So not that knight d3 is terrible or anything, it might be the best move, but my point is that white would actually have to spend resources defending a little bit and keeping his position together. Still, white's better. You know, the d5 pawn is weak. Black has two isolated pawns and white has one, so black has a worse pawn structure. And black's bishop on b7 is worse as well than white's on g2. But getting counterplay and activity can keep you in a game when you have a slight disadvantage like this. And this is definitely what Bernstein should have gone for. Uh, instead, he wanted to just kick the knight, which seems like a reasonable move. But the problem is that knight d4 is a great square anyway. And even if you trade, which he did, now b6 is weak. So Khan is actually keeping up some small initiative here. Queen d6, and uh, even a move like a3 will keep a positional, well, a positional win, really. But uh, Khan plays a, an uncharacteristically aggressive and tricky move. He must have just thought it was good for him, which it, it probably he's winning afterwards, so no, uh, no shame in playing the move knight c4. I don't think it's a bad move at all. Taking advantage of the pin on the d-file, so he took on b4. Then we could take on b6. Hitting the rook, they traded on d4 and moved the rook. So Khan was happy to trade the queens, which makes sense because he has a better pawn structure. As I've mentioned several times, when you have a, uh, a better pawn structure than your opponent, it's easiest to exploit that bad pawn structure when you're in an endgame. So any trade should generally, generally benefit white as long as white doesn't have to go out of his way for it, which he obviously didn't really have to do here. And uh, yeah, he's got still the initiative going because uh, this is hanging, or it's loose, I mean, and these guys are all pretty passive. And white's obviously very active with his rooks. Knight and bishop are all putting pressure on black's position. So he goes for rook cd1, doubling it up. Rook e8 to counterattack on e2. He protects it. And then knight e4. So his point is, if you take here, like knight takes, bishop takes, rook takes, it's going to be forked out, knight c3. So rook c1 to prevent that. Still actually threatening to take d5, kind of. Um, but Bernstein plays a good move here. He goes for g6, which sort of ignores the hanging pawn, right? But and not really. Not really. It's actually making Luft and... He's preparing to counterattack if you take the pawn. Like I mentioned earlier, Khan isn't one to, um, to take a pawn when he's positionally winning and give you counterplay. 
That's like the last thing he wants to do. He'd rather keep the stranglehold and try to win the pawn when it's no counterplay. He could have taken on d5. Here's the point that uh, Bernstein was going for. He'll take like this, and he'll play rook b2, right, counterplay against f2 and a2. And the idea of making lift was, was that if he didn't do that in this position, it would be bishop takes knight, and you can't take with the rook because it's back rank mate. So Bernstein was preparing this idea by making Luft with g6. However, a computer likes uh, white here. It says it's winning, actually, if you play an accurate move. Rook d4, x clam. Accurate move there. The idea of rook d4 is that if you take on f2 with the knight because your knight's hanging, then we'll play rook f1, and the knight's actually trapped. Kind of funny. But this rook on d4 cuts off two escape, actually three escape squares that the knight can go to. Even maybe four if you want to count it, but okay, the rook on f1 did that too. So the knight is actually trapped here. So rook d4 is a good move that makes this defense by Bernstein not exactly work out. For example, if you play knight f6, he can just go rook c6, forking, and then we'll take on a6 and protect our a pawn, be up two pawns, and a and, and pretty easy win. Well, still some technical difficulties, but pretty sure Khan would win that. So Khan could have actually taken the pawn. He also has the idea to just take the knight. Yeah. And if you take with the pawn to fix your pawn structure, he has this idea to go in for the fork. That's the point of taking the knight. You can't, uh, you can't guard f6 anymore. So you'd have to play actually rook takes. But after rook c7, we can play this endgame where it's good knight against bad bishop. Right, a classic endgame. You see that all the time. And uh, yeah, this is going to be positionally winning for, for white at this point. But uh, Khan doesn't have to do that. He played rook c7, knight d6, threatening the fork. And Khan plays tactically here. Um, a4 is fine, by the way. A4 is just fine. He can even get away with bishop takes d5, though he has to calculate a lot of tactics there. The idea is that knight b5 is met by bishop takes f7 with a, a counter fork. But he actually goes for, I mean, I would think that he'd play a4. That's really in his style. But uh, he, I guess he felt really inspired this game because uh, he played a lot of aggressive moves here, including at this moment. He went for knight d7, which doesn't particularly work out great for Khan, uh, especially after his Bernstein's next defensive move, which was great. He, uh, he goes for rook e c8. Brilliant move, actually. So his rook is hanging on b8. He's also trying to fork him on f6. And rook e c8 deals with both of those threats. It counterattacks the rook, obviously. So if you take my rook, I take your rook, which I think that happened during the game, actually. Um, or if you trade rooks, we'll take with the rook, saving our rook. And it also gets out of the fork, of course. Really nice. In case you were thinking, what about just knight b5 anyway? Uh, he would give the check and take this. Take here, keeping the fork going. But we can take like this. Yeah, even here. And if you take the rook and I take your rook, that's going to be winning for white, obviously. So you got to try rook d7. But we can just check out of there and then uh, escape with the bishop next move with a uh, yeah, technical win. Up a pawn, rook and bishop's better than rook and knight, so that'll be a, a technical win for sure. Rook ec8 was played instead, better defense. And uh, yeah, Khan actually takes the rook. He's, he's really giving away his advantage with, these, with this idea. Uh, he, he should have taken here, and then taken on d5, give me that free pawn. Uh, might as well throw in this check, take this attacking the knight, and knight b5. So here he's up a pawn, but there are technical difficulties. The knight is hanging, this move's coming, and that move's in the air as well. So he's got to watch out for the fork, he's got to watch out for rook c2, and uh, this is definitely not a technical win, uh, yet at least. He's, uh, he's got a lot to worry about at this point. The way the game went, it was actually even... Uh, even less convincing, though. At least he's, he's up a pawn there, and he could try to win it. But 
after knight takes b8, and then bishop takes d5, um, Bernstein missed the chance here to get a pretty more or less even position with the same idea that he had earlier in the game, actually. Bishop takes d5. Well, he played knight b5, but he should play bishop takes d5, followed by knight e4. Yeah, knight e4 is the key idea to play rook c2 counterattack. And I know that Khan understood this, and he thought that he wanted this version of this idea because now his knight's attacking on a6, and he could take that pawn. But his knight's actually pretty bad over here once he takes the pawn. He's going to lose the pawn back, maybe even both pawns back. And uh, it's really not enough to even be better. The activity and the counterplay that black gets is going to more than compensate for the pawn down. He'll probably be down a pawn. But, um, yeah, this is not a win at all for white. I mean, obviously white's going to be better <clears throat> when he's up a pawn and black has compensation. But just for your edification, uh, computer says that it's just equal here. Like, just dead equal. So... I'm pretty sure that Khan understood this position might happen and thought he could still be better, um, which is fair. But his knight's going to be pretty bad over there on the queen side, and it's not necessarily the best version of, of taking the d-pawn. We, we looked at a couple better examples earlier that he could have gone for. But Bernstein, I guess he believed him and just went for knight b5. Maybe he had already uh, sort of forgotten about the knight e4 idea. 94 rook c2, or, or just thought it wasn't as good as before. Rook d2 to stop rook c2, really nice. Check. And trades it. And yeah, here still, Bernstein could still get into a position where he's, he's not lost, but he makes one inaccuracy here, and it ends up losing him the game. Uh, he goes for rook a1 which ends up, like I said, not really working out for him after knight takes a6, gives a check, knight b4. Now you can't take this pawn because I'll play rook a8. You know, if you take with the knight, I'll play rook a8, pinning you and winning the exchange. So that is not an acceptable defense. So instead of rook a1, Bernstein could have tried knight c3 first, I think perhaps he was concerned about rook d8 check and then a3. But still, he has the idea knight e4, rook c2. Same idea as before. And yeah, this knight is just looking really silly over here. I'm sure it'll take the pawn, but it's not defending against f2. We can still try to take the a pawn later. And this is definitely enough counterplay for black to keep playing the position and not being lost, at least. I also, by the way, looked at rook c5 instead of rook check. Knight a2, like this, but um, yeah, this will be definitely a draw. Oh, White has winning chances here. I don't want you to think that they'll agree to a draw here. No way. White's up a pawn. I've won positions just like this, even in slow games. Um, and so, you know, up a pawn in a knight endgame, you can still try to win. But as you would imagine, with all the pawns on the same side of the board, it's not going to be a lot of winning chances. It's difficult to make a passed pawn. Um, you're going to have to trade a lot of pawns away. And if you do end up, like let's say black plays h5, and you end up making a passed pawn the traditional way with h3, g4, f5, e6, like this, then black will trade all the pawns. You'll be left with one pawn on e6, and he'll just sacrifice his knight for that pawn, and it'll be king and knight against king, which of course is a draw. So... Um, this is definitely a draw with best play, but they could still play it out, I guess. So knight c3 didn't have too many uh, difficulties there for black. And like I said, maybe he was concerned with rook d8 check and, and a3, but um, I was still finding black getting enough counterplay to hold the position at that point. Rook a1 was played instead, and then uh, Bernstein was basically basically winning. At this point, he's up two pawns now, which is kind of a lot. Yeah, knight c3, knight d4. Yeah, I mean, maybe knight b4 is a little bit more accurate because uh, after rook a1, rook d3, knight e4, the, the benefit of knight b4 is that it stops knight, uh, rook a2, 
right? That controls the a2 square. So we could play f3 and have no problem with knight e4 and the rook coming to the second rank anymore. That, that idea that we've talked about already uh, at least three or four times has, uh, has, has no merit in this position because of knight b4. So when he played knight d4, probably Bernstein should have played rook a1, which he didn't at this point, and then knight e4. Yeah, I mean, if you take the pawn, you're, you're in like a permanent pin here. This is probably what both sides were thinking about, that you can't just play rook a1 and take the pawn because this is, this is going to lose. No doubt about that. You can't just have it where you can't move any of your pieces and you're down a pawn. You know, that, that's going to be a big problem. But yeah, if he gets this idea going, now he can play rook a2. For example, oh, sorry, I didn't mean, I just meant to get rid of the arrow there. For example, f3, rook a2 check, knight d2 check, knight c4. I mean, you can see that a lot of pawns are weak for white at this point. And even though he's up two pawns, he's probably going to lose at least one of them back. And his king is terrible, and black's pieces are very active. I mean, after h4, white's still much better. White can never really be worse here unless he loses many pawns. But this is definitely causing a lot of difficulty for white. Uh, black is, um, is creating a lot of counterplay. I mean, he could even take the a pawn right now if he wanted to. So, yeah, uh, this, would, this would still not necessarily be a, a win yet. So a little bit of a technical flub there with knight b4, knight d4 instead of knight b4. Um, but yeah, very difficult uh, and, and delicate maneuver to make and understand the situation there. But it seems like both sides sort of gave up on black playing knight e4 and getting to the second rank. That's what it feels like to me, like both sides sort of felt like that's not going to happen anymore. But it actually could have. Here. And yeah, for the rest of the game, he actually wins it quite handily. He has no problems anymore. With the rook on a2, it protects the second rank, and it gets behind the pawn. And the knight on b1 is not great. And now it's actually a pretty easy win at this point. Even somebody like, even somebody like me might win it. <laughs> I would like to think. Yeah. Oh, now I would definitely win, for the record. <laughs> no doubt about that. Here. And then after some more moves... Which, I don't know why he played on, really. Even uh, most couple players would win here. Knight f3 to stop the skewer. And after takes, he resigned. I think, well, I'm just guessing here. I think that Khan, like, picked up his h-pawn, and he was going to play h-takes. And Bernstein's like, okay, I resign. You know, he was sort of hoping for knight takes, rook check, where uh, black is obviously not losing because he wins the rook for free. So just one last, uh, one last hurrah there for Bernstein, but he knew he'd, he'd lose at this point, so ends up resigning. So another great game by Khan. Some very minor technical errors there that uh, are very, you know, it's hard for me to criticize because I would, I would never play so accurately myself, but for the sake of, uh, you know, for the sake of education, we, we should mention them. But still a beautiful positional game. I like how he played very positionally early on, like very solid and, and in a positional way, you know, I'm just thinking back to, let's say, this position, where uh, he's got everything set up just like a, a, a picture-perfect isolated queen pawn for white, right? He's got all the pieces on great squares, actively placed, putting pressure on, on the d-pawn, and, and then he starts to get really aggressive here with knight e5, then knight b5, and uh, yeah, gets even more tactics erupt around this moment, too. So Khan played it in a very inspired way, um, made a, a couple of errors there, but definitely not, not too much that you, could, uh, that you could seriously criticize in practice, at least. And uh, yeah, and another great game by, by Khan. Um, I prepared three games, but as usual, you know, I didn't get through. <laughs> it took too much time on the first two. But uh, I like the similarities between those two, so I think that they were, were pretty nice, pretty instructive games. And uh, hopefully you learned a lot about the, the life and games of Sultan Khan. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed, please consider to leave a like and subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube. Thanks. Bye-bye.